and uh, I will be the chairman of this last session this morning. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so, without further ado, let's start uh, with uh, uh, David Ferguson's talk uh, on pushing the limits of analog computing and quantum annealing, design progress and theoretical concepts. Yeah, it's great. Um, I assume the microphone's working well? Yeah, all right. I'll just kind of lean in here. I get, I, my, my voice will, might get a little bit elevated. I get ex I'm easily excited. So, and I'm, I'm, I think it's been a very uh, exciting conference. There's been a lot of things that have really made me uh, sit up and take notice, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, continue that trend here a little. I'm hoping that this talk will be a bit of a synthesis. It does touch on uh, a lot of uh, other ideas that uh, people have uh, presented in research in detail. So I hope um, many research groups find it interesting. Let's see here, did that advance the slide? That didn't. Let's just go with a right arrow quick. Did that work? Oh, I know what I need to do. Click here, and then like, yeah, okay. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Northrop Grumman. Um, so uh, one of the, of course, one of the most exciting things happening in science right now is the James Webb Space Telescope, and uh, Northrop Grumman is the prime contractor on that. You know, so there's this great YouTube video called like 29 Days on the Edge, where they talk about, you know, they're gonna have to put this thing on the, this uh, Ariane 5, um, blast it off, um, uh, from French Guiana, and, and it's going to shake, and then they got to, you know, put out its sun shields and everything like that, and it's a fantastic video, and it's just amazing that it all worked. It makes you proud to be part of Northrop Grumman. And there's a quote in that video where it says that the James Webb is the perfect example of scientific desire driving engineering capabilities to new frontiers. And I feel very similarly about the era of computing that we're in, where you're kind of in this regime where there's a the growing demand for novel compute capabilities. And um, so I kind of borrowed that and, and put this as the title of this slide, that uh, Northrop Grumman's computing research is the perfect example of modern computing imperatives driving engineering capabilities to new frontiers. And we've got a fantastic team there. Um, our team is centered uh, in Baltimore, but we have um, an expert team out in Colorado. Um, we may be looking to expand in a couple of other locations. One, one of the fun things um, uh, about Northrop Grumman, of course, is over the years it was formed from a lot of different companies. One of our uh, parent companies is Westinghouse, and actually Zener of Landau Zener himself, uh, Clarence Zener, um, was actually director of science at Westinghouse for almost 15 years. So he's really in our academic legacy, and of course the the, this kind of uh, Landau Zener physics is a, is a big part of, of what we're doing here this week. So, um, so we do a full range of superconducting uh, technologies. Um, we do classical digital technologies. We do superconducting qubit technologies. Um, and of course, we do uh, adiabatic uh, optimization of the whole range. And so uh, it's quite an exciting time there at Northrop Grumman. <coughs> So as I was saying, that the uh, slowing of traditional scaling metrics um, and the shift to uh, AI workloads, they're generating new imperatives for ultra-efficient machine learning accelerators. And so even kind of um, apart from uh, quantum mechanics, you know, it's kind of a, a uh, Cambrian explosion of new compute technologies. Here I've kind of highlighted uh, uh, two of them are, you know, here, uh, th this kind of wafer square scale computing is certainly interesting to keep an eye on. And of course, people have heard of these TPU pods and pod racers and all this other type of stuff, the stuff that, that Google and DeepMind are doing. We've heard, we heard a bit about uh, the coherent icing machines. It's a, an incredibly uh, uh, fascinating technology keeping our eyes on. Um, and of course, you know, down here uh, you have superconducting technologies that are doing um, um, very promising things as well on the quantum side. So just kind of as an overall summary, um, especially in the area um, um, you know, of, of ultra-low power eventually, I think that superconducting annealing, both quantum and classical, are, are promising compute frameworks that are going to help 
uh, meet these new imperatives. So <clears throat> the things that I'm going to talk about to, uh, today are a bit of a digression um, from the way that people uh, often think of these circuits in terms of two-level systems. I'll kind of insist on focusing on the kind of the fundamental variables of the circuit, the lumped element charges and fluxes. And the reason for this is that, of course, you know, you, you, at working at Northrop Grumman, you get to work with a lot of graybeards that have been working in this field forever. And you say, well, how, <laughs> what is, what, how does an engineer thinking, think about the variables of the circuit? How, what is your classical model? And I'll tell you a little bit as to, as a theoretical physicist, how I've interpreted what they've said. <laughs> um, uh, then I'm going to talk a bit about a, a, a analog artificial neural networks, and I'll kind of explain um, uh, what I mean there. Um, <clears throat> then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what does it, how might I imi uh, imagine that if you start from some, something like a, a primitive compute capability in this analog neural network side, and then you want to ask, uh, you want to ask the question, sorry, this laser's a little bit off. Um, you want to ask the question of, even for a primitive compute operation where you're kind of doing something similar to uh, a, a, you know, an individual instruction operation, can an individual operation have a quantum advantage, even independent of the scaling limit? So I kind of at the existing scale at which uh, instructions are uh, imp implemented right now, can you have a, a uh, quantum advantage for a primitive operation? And then I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the design work and the simulation work uh, uh, that we're doing at Northrop Grumman to help us move this technology forward. All right, <clears throat> so here's a pretty busy slide, but it has um, two essential parts here um, that are kind of repetitive. So these, these are the, if I kind of, you look down here on the, the bottom part of the screen here, you, you kind of have a picture of a little array of, um, you know, six uh, flux qubits. Uh, you know, uh, tunable flux qubits that you might want to anneal by putting flux here in these, what we call the X loop. And you want to imagine that there are kind of mutual interactions between neighbors, maybe perhaps implemented with a tunable coupler. So there might be that gamma IJ may be tunable. And then you say, what is the actual Hamiltonian for, that is relevant for these charges that build up on these uh, uh, capacitors and for these fluxes that are stored in these loops? And on the, on the classical side, you know, again, this goes back to what I was talking about in terms of talking to the engineers. Um, this, is, this is what it is. You just kind of have charging energy. You have, <laughs> let me see whether I can, uh, maybe I can use a laser pointer here. It'll be better. Let's use that. <clears throat> you have the inductive energy. You have the Josephson energy. And then you have the mutual interactions between them. And when you do Hamiltonian's equations of motion, you know, you just kind of say, uh, you know, for instance, Q dot is equal to dh by d phi. You actually see that this is equivalent to Kirchhoff's laws, you know. And so um, it basically said, you know, it's kind of the fundamental reason why the engineers are telling you, you know, use this model. It's just because, you know, of course, this is, a, this, is, this is what you learn in electrical engineering class to kind of use these kind of current conservation rules um, that really help you accurately model these circuits that are, it's valid outside of the two-level approximation. So even if you have kind of things in your double well and uh, you have some remaining harmonic, you know, degrees of freedom that kind of form into collective modes of your entire circuit, that this type of, this type of kind of uh, using continuous variables to describe the dynamics of your system um, can capture a lot, lot larger range of, 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 the, of that physics. So to get to the quantum side, of course, um, you know, flux and charge are conjugate variables like position and momentum, and so you just have to put hats on everything, and, and then, then uh, it becomes a, a quantum mechanical uh, Hamiltonian. And this, of course, is the Hamiltonian from which the two-level approximation can be uh, uh, derived if you want to go there. Um, but for this talk, I'm, we're going to stay in terms of uh, the, this quantum uh, Hamiltonian and this classical Hamiltonian, and we'll talk about using it directly. So, of course, there's this, a really nice theory um, that allows you to, to um, transform a very natural transformation between uh, classical and, and quantum physics, um, uh, uh, wigner weil transformations, and... Uh, Here's an example of a Wigner function where you kind of take the plus state and you kind of see it has this nice behavior, you know, where it's going to be left and 
uh, right well simultaneously and you get these interference fringes um, here when you kind of calculate the marginal probability distributions you begin to see some sort of um, wave-like behavior. So <clears throat> one of the interesting things to consider is what are the fundamental ways that if you, if you do try to describe things in terms of um, uh, your density matrix in terms of a, 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 an operator description and you kind of do this wigner vial map, you can basically say, oh, um, these operators get mapped to probability distributions like this one here. And uh, you can then kind of, in the same way that, you know, it's always annoying when you want to go on, figure out what are your Hermite uh, uh, polynomials, uh, you know, for quantum mechanics, you have to decide, oh, wait, are those the probabilist <laughs> um, Hermite polynomials or the, or the quantum uh, physicists? And they are, they're because they're useful in both contexts. And so this is, this is a, a generalization where, um, of course, uh, USC has done a really, a lot of great work of defining what uh, these adiabatic eigenstates would be um, as a function of Neil. You can transform them into operators and, um, and potentially use them as a basis for your classical probability distributions and then kind of figure out how does probability slosh between that on the classical side and kind of then derive some fundamental differences between, of course, how quantum and classical are behaving. So this is just one of the types of ways that looking at things from this type of perspective kind of opens new vistas on, on understanding what is the computational power between these two frameworks. All right. So <clears throat> one thing I wanted to touch on very briefly is that uh, one particular way that the choice of abstraction level can be important for understanding novel com uh, computational resources, and that's in the case study of non-stochasticity that we've heard about some this week. Um, and of course, there was this great experiment by D-Wave that kind of showed that if you, uh, if you couple things both by a mutual inductance as well as by a fixed capacitable, capacitive inductance, if you go to a two-level description, that indeed uh, there is a degree of non-stochasticity that cannot be removed. However, at the circuit Hamiltonian level, um, of course, the, the Hamiltonian is fully stochastic without any offset charges. And so you have this kind of uh, you know, question of, wait, is what's primitive the two-level description or is it kind of the circuit Hamiltonian description that I've been talking about? And in terms of you know, because you know that somehow, you know, from these adiabatic theorems that somehow plus xx is, is fundamental for, for universality, at least that's the construction that people have proven is, is uh, you can get a universal construction there. So somehow if you go to the two-level description, is this kind of uh, losing too much? Um, and further, uh, there's this nice proposal that, that, uh, that may, may be getting uh, revived is, is these kind of notions of these face slip, uh, face slip qubits and there it has this nice, uh, nice um, uh, properties that even at the two level descriptions, it's strongly non-stochastic, meaning that you can have large non-stochastic interactions between these, these two qubits while the single qubit fields are zero, while the equivalent single qubit X fields are zero. And I think that property is very important to have this capability to have a qubit that has strong interactions, um, novel interactions, both XX and ZZ, um, while the single qubit fields are zero. I think that's really going to um, unleash uh, a lot of, uh, of new uh, design capability. And one, one final thing that I'll say is that I think a very under, underappreciated uh, result that's been uh, coming out of the group of the collaboration between Rutgers and UMass Boston are these examples where you have this kind of charge sensitive island here, uh, very similar to the, the, the face slip, these kind of uh, annealing capable face slip qubits that uh, Northrop Grumman together with the QEO team and of course Lincoln Lab have de demonstrated some capabilities for. We've demonstrated the charge tuning and we've de de demonstrated that you can't anneal these. Um, but, so this one's not tunable, uh, but what they did show was that when they, when they basically have this uh, island have a larger gap by having a little bit thinner aluminum, um, and as well as surrounding things by a superinductance, they get charge stability, i.e., you know, they don't have, they have quasi-particle poisoning events. So here, this kind of turning blue to yellow is an example of a quasi-particle uh, poisoning event. But they get quasi-particle charge stability on the, on the timescales of an hour. And that's a huge, huge timescales. And you don't see it in any other system. And so, um, um, so kind of making sure that you have these capabilities where you have this gap engineering and you're surrounding things by superinductance, those two key things together, 
I think that it's a really promising moment to go back and, and look at these non-stochastic systems. And we heard some uh, great, great work from UCL kind of looking at how you might begin to utilize those. All right, so here's just kind of a little summary of, of where we're gonna go. Um, we're gonna focus here on the top of, you know, between the classical circuit model, that's why it's green, and the quantum circuit model, we'll talk about that a little bit. And of course, uh, you know, what people are more used to is thinking about going in this one-way direction down here to the qubit approximation, and then, then also looking at the classical spin models. But of course, this, this one is a bit way more tricky to make a, a nice wigner weil uh, uh, dual description between a two-level system and a spin model, because a lot of spin models have a natural, natural like, you know, spin one, um, uh, non, you know, is their first non-trivial representation. But anyway, that's, that's a little side note. Um, yeah. So here's an example of a, you know, a, a, a number of um, interacting, interacting uh, uh, you know, classical flux qubits, which I'll call AFPs for um, analog flux parametrons. Uh, they go by many names, and you can get, just kind of uh, think of them as, uh, you know, the, the, a flux qubit operating in the classical regime. And uh, you can see that, you know, it's kind of some, some uh, pretty standard, uh, you know, it's kind of like oscillating back and forth as the charge and flux are kind of sloshing uh, back and forth against each other. And if you look over here at the phase, it kind of does what you would expect as you go through the anneal, then they, you know, it decides which well to go in based on the interactions, and it kind of goes through this icing instability. So <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I think D-Wave has, has convinced us at this conference, and they've been saying it for a long time, is that um, you know, Quantum Monte Carlo um, is a study of the equilibrium properties of, of, um, super, of, of quantum superconducting circuits, but it's but uh, when your dynamics, they can be adiabatic, um, i.e. you're kind of, you can change your fields uh, uh, quickly, or sorry, slowly with respect to any sort of intrinsic frequency scale. However, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be thermalizing all the time, you know? And so really the Schrodinger evolution is primitive. But the same is true of classical dynamics as well. So, you, you know, a, 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 a uh, you know, Hamiltonian dynamics, um, um, you know, if you kind of adjust your, uh, your Hamiltonian slowly compared to the plasma frequency scale, um, but the RC time, time constant, the time scale at which you equilibrate at, is very long compared to those time scales, you can do things like, you know, as your well, come, uh, well gets wider, your qubit is going, or your qubit, <laughs> your, your classical uh, flux qubit basically can undergo cooling. And that's what you see here in terms of the charge fluctuations uh, really reducing as you're kind of widening the, the harmonic well. And so it's these types of effects that are, are the, at the heart of the reason why, you know, uh, uh, that these kind of classical models are very useful for capturing all the physics that are really there in these circuits. And, and you don't kind of, you know, uh, just focus on, on the, on the, on the two-level approximation or on a spin approximation um, you kind of lose some of those physics. All right. So <clears throat> what, in what way can uh, uh, Hamiltonian evolution uh, give you a computational advantage? So one of the things that's really nice about uh, modeling classical circuits, of course, is that um, um, you can model them up to giant scales. You don't have this problem where, you know, oh, it's going to be super hard to model 100 uh, quantum, uh, you know, uh, you know, qubits uh, um, at the uh, doing dynamics. Um, that's not a problem for. Um, let me just do that's not a problem for classical dynamics. The, the, the simulation resources basically scale linearly. Although they're, you know, depend, if you have a dense matrix of interactions, it can get a little bit more complicated. Um, but um, so where can you find a, uh, a computing advantage? You know, doesn't, isn't, you know, CMOS is CMOS. You've been engineering it forever. But um, one of the downsides of CMOS is that it's an, in, 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 it's an intrinsically dissipative technology. You know, there is no Hamiltonian from which the, well, 
I would just say that the resistive dynamics are the dominant form of the dynamics. You're kind of like in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the regime where, um, you know, if you look at the, uh, the evolution in terms, this kind of the, the inductive, the terms that come from any sort of inductive energy are just minimal compared to the terms that come from the resistance. And so you're always uh, intrinsically dissipative. Whereas for superconducting circuits, it, you know, we've done a ton of engineering now to be able to get them in, to be in this very high Q, low resistance uh, regime. And so basically the evolution um, can be very nonlinear, so you can do lots of interesting computing things, but you can basically do things with Hamiltonian evolution. And Hamiltonian evolution is uh, perfectly reversible. So um, basically what you can do is you can kind of generalize the Bennett construction for reversible computing, where instead of having some you know, primitive, logically reversible uh, compute operations up here, and then you can basically just, any sort of irreversible compute you want to do, you can basically, oh, change that, you know, um, uh, change that, you know, uh, AND gate or whatever um, into, you know, something that, that is actually formally reversible by keeping extra you know, ancillas, and instead of having one output, you have two outputs, and now by those having two outputs, you can then um, know what came before it, so you can generalize any, um, you know, irreversible evolution to something that's logically reversible, and then you imagine doing all of that computing, and you get your answer, but then you also have, you know, all these kind of zero initialized uh, auxiliary bits that have gotten your, you know, your garbage bits, so what do you do there? Well, you take your answer, you get more zero initialized things, and you do one final controlled knot, and you get your answer down here, and then you've got to implement the reverse, all the reverse um, uh, reversible operations, and then you set all of this back to zero. So this was you know, Bennett's observation that you can actually do, you can get any answer to, uh, to a com uh, computation without generating any entropy. And so this is what we're going to evaluate. We're going to see whether there is an interesting compute from Hamiltonian evolution of these AFPs. Um, you know, we can go to giant scales and, and see that, that um, um, uh, you know, like, you know, really kind of look towards application relevance. Um, and, um, and then further, what you can see, you can ask the question of, all right, in simulation, how close to this reversible limit uh, can you get? And can you formulate um, application relevance from that? Is it, is it good enough such that you'd be like, wow, if we really engineered that, we'd, be, we'd, we'd have you know, a compute that would you know, blow away existing technological approaches? And I do think that there is this kind of notion of like, well, what type of Moore's law scaling um, might you get? You know, if you do have this kind of technology that's not land, limited by Landauer's, the, you know, Landauer's principle, um, where you could get arbitrarily efficient in your compute going forward, um, that you know you could have a situation where if you kind of made the right in investments, that you could get you know you could have an exponentially uh, exponentially growing efficiency over an extended period of time with no fundamental limit. Whereas if you use um, irreversible technology, you will be fundamentally you'll be kind of coming into that uh, Landauer limit um, pretty quickly. All right. <clears throat> So um, now to motivate, what do, what do we want to use? Um, what do we want to use these analog dynamics for? So I would kind of uh, break uh, for you know at a very high level. What would what is the what is a modern taxonomy of classical computing architectures? So I'm not even putting Ising machines on here. I'm not doing anything quantum mechanics. These are just things that there's a ton of it out there right now. Okay. And here is the, just an example of an instruction set architecture. This is by far the dominant uh, technology. Um, except for, this is a fascinating uh, example where they've taken um, these uh, classical flux qubits, uh, in this case, this team calls them AQFPs, and they've actually implemented um, a, you know, a four-bit CPU here. And it's really interesting to think about, you know, a lot of times people think about Oh yeah, you know, just run, you know, compare the D wave to your to uh, running it on a CPU. Well, I think it's really fun to think about of running it on this CPU, right? Where you know, here in this example, you know, you do have things that are annealing and unannealing and all this type of stuff, and you can see all these flux quantum moving around, and and you really kind of think about, oh, you've got to go from you know. 
from the from your from your register to your to your, you know your CPU, and then it's got to move back and forth, and you really see how physically taxing it is to move all this information around all the time. Whereas what what um, what D-Wave does, of course, is super efficient. You know, it's just like let's do it all at once, boom, you know, and it's done. And you can really kind of contrast it um, and see that advantage. And of course, all the way on this side is the neuromorphic computing. Um, and there I would say the major challenge is, is even though it's ubiquitous, it's what's happening in all of our minds right now, um, super powerful obviously, uh, evolution seems to have figured that out, um, but harnessing it from a technological perspective, we're still quite not sure how to make it work. You know, these are asynchronous, you know, how do you do the training, all this type of stuff, it's, it's, it's still a bit beyond our, our engineering capabilities, even at the level of a nematode. You kind of understand what the hardware is, but you're not quite sure um, you're not quite sure how to engineer it. <laughs> you know, how is it that it's learning and, and, and doing its thing? So we've kind of, uh, you know, resulted in this compromise of these artificial neural networks where it's much more structured. You know, it's much, you know, it's, it's these, are the, these are the types of networks, of course, there are generalizations that, that people uh, are exploring, but these are the ones that are kind of appear to be most application relevant in the current era. You just kind of have these feed, for, feed forward artificial neural networks where you train up these weights and you need some sort of nonlinear activation and then you feed forward again, nonlinear activation, and, and of course you then want to uh, implement this into some larger, larger uh, architecture. But I want to ask the fundamental question of what's the best way to implement this? Right now, the way that it's implemented, of course, is you just reduce all of this back to you know, your instruction set architecture. Maybe you get a TPU or whatever, you know, the novel, novel uh, implementation. But at the fundamental level, it's gonna be something that looks like this. But what if we could do this more like this? We implemented this in an analog way. And so that's what I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll describe. And in particular, you can ask the question of, if you do this analog dynamics, and then you combine it with the Bennett construction, is it reversible or not? Or how far away from uh, reversibility are you? All right. So. Uh, um, what, what, what simulation did we do? So uh, basically, we, we took a uh, simulation where you took a, a, an initial image, and uh, that initial image um, had some sort of weight, and uh, uh, you know, th that weight matrix multiplied times the initial image through some, you can, you can imagine it's, it's through some sort of uh, interaction matrix, mutual matrix perhaps, and then uh, basically this blue arrow says the first layer of AFQs, a AFPs, they anneal, okay? And annealing is a very nonlinear uh, transformation. It functions a lot like a hyperbolic tangent. When you look at as a function of its activation level, you know, which well does it end up going in? Um, it looks like a hyperbolic tangent. Um, and then, you know, the, then you imagine, okay, now I have a second layer of uh, weights between that first layer of AFPs and it's the second layer of AFPs, and then uh, I anneal the second one. And then the second one is where I've kind of imagined, okay, I'm going to now do the Bennett construction, I'm gonna copy it, move that information out, now I'm gonna reverse it back and see what is it, what is it uh, you know, how much entropy is generated, okay? And you can basically, so uh, how these simulations work is, although we are assuming that the resistance is very, very long, um, we've, we kind of assume that you, can, you start from something where you're sampling the phase space from a thermal distribution. So you do have some sort of noise, or at least characterized by a thermal distribution initially, and you see after you do this dynamics, how much did that, that RMS fluctuation of charge in, increase? And then you can say, all right, well, I'm gonna have to, you know, have enough resistance to kind of like bring this level back down to that so that things don't blow up and get out of hand. Um, and then you, from that, you can kind of say, that's how much uh, uh, dissipation you need uh, for this technology to work. And then finally, we'll ask the question of, um, if you then replace your charge operators, and you add your hats back, is this a good thing or a bad thing? You know, is there a way of quantifying that? So here, here it is again. Um, so you, 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 we've done the, the, the fashion MNIST data set just to be a little bit fashionable. And um, uh, so here's this weight matrix. Um, so initially we, we did a standard conventional artificial neural network where you just, instead of using, I think, uh, um, 
you know, rectified linear is more fashionable these days, where it's just kind of a linear and then, or, you know, constant zero and then a linear here. But hyperbolic tangent is, uh, you know, um, was fashionable at one point. And so you can bus basically just plug that in and you can, you know, just train this up. And here at, uh, you've uh, took, that, take, took that final information out of the network and did a softmax. Uh, well, I, 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 sorry, you did a one, one more uh, fully connected layer that I was imagining. Ah, okay, that's done in, um, in, 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 standard, in standard technology, um, digital technology or whatever, um, and then you do some softmax. Um, I didn't necessarily, I didn't make this analog dynamics over here, though perhaps maybe you could. Uh, I just focused on these parts. And uh, so first I just did everything digitally with a standard uh, artificial neural network. I trained up all these weights. And it's dense. It's just completely dense. Um, and then I just by hand, because in simulation you can do anything. You don't have to worry about layout rules. I just said, okay, just use that dense matrix, multiply it by the right you know, coefficient so it actually became in units of uh, picohenry or whatever, and um, um, had a mutual interaction between each one of these pixels and each one of these 100 AFBs, and then a, a mutual interactions between each of these 100 AFPs and each of these 100 AFPs, and I just kind of, without no additional training, with no additional training, I just did the analog dynamics of the AFP, and I saw that the classification accuracy did not decrease. And so you can basically, um, you don't even need to do um, any, uh, any additional training. You can just kind of do all of your training on your standard, um, you know, digital, artificial neural network and on your analog artificial neural network, um, it, just, it just works, at least in this, in this example. All right, so uh, that kind of mutual matrix, that all to all mutual matrix is a little bit artificial. So what you can do is you can um, basically imagine that you have a coupler network, okay? So in, uh, you have your, your image kind of uh, biasing one side of this coupler network and then you have a whole bunch of couplers uh, within a network and then you have your AFPs on the other side of the network, say, it doesn't have to be quite that geometry, but then all of these nodes of your coupler network, they can um, be imagined, especially if their frequency is higher, to um, mediate an interaction between your image and your AFPs. And um, you know, there are some good approximations. So this, this is a, uh, you can do a Born-Oppenheimer approximation where, where this is kind of, uh, instead of a clamped nuclei, you can think of this as a clamped source. Um, but basically, you can derive um, how to uh, uh, an effective mutual interaction that's dense. That's dense between this image and the AFPs. Okay, you do involve this inverse matrix, and so it becomes a little bit challenging to train. Um, uh, but you can do it. And so um, uh, basically, you know, you just kind of plug this formalism. You define yourself a custom layer in Keras or whatever, and then you train it up digitally, and then you implement it with your analog dynamics, and you see again that it works for a physically realistic coupler network. So then you kind of do the, do the estimate. You say, is this a promising technological approach, okay? And you say, well, you know what? Let's give this, the CMOS guys an advantage. They've, they're, they're thinking about how to do this in ultra-low power ways. So one of the, big, the biggest things is this kind of von Neumann bottleneck of bringing all this information from the memory, out of the memory, back to the memory, back to the CPU or wherever, you know. Uh, moving it around. So instead, you just imagine leaving all the weights um, on chip, and then you just kind of run your, your image data through it, okay? And so you kind of avoid the von Neumann bottleneck, and there's, there's uh, this kind of in-memory compute is, is a hot area of uh, uh, research. And um, they show, they do still have to, they don't implement any of the nonlinear activations here on chip, so they, 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 they are uh, uh, doing some um, not everything is, is accounted for here, but um, um, uh, they get 98% accuracy, a little bit higher um, than, than we were seeing over here, which was 96% ac uh, accuracy. And they get really awesome uh, energy for classification. So this is all the operations that are necessary to do uh, this classification at 98% accuracy. Um, and they get, you know, uh, energy per classification of, you know, uh, uh, of, th of, of this many joules, okay? So um, for this little trusty laptop over here, um, um, I, of course, did all of those, those previous calculations that uh, I was talking about. Again, I only trained it up to 96% accuracy. Um, and uh, kind of looking at the meters on that machine, I can figure out that actually, uh, for that 90% accuracy, 
just doing the inference, none of the training, just the inference step. It is, uh, you know, uh, 750 microjoules. You know, this did have all the nonlinear activations, everything like that. So this was the full compute, all right? But it's still many orders of magnitude more than this one. In this one, you know, for when you're doing the analog AFP estimation and you're just doing that step where you're looking at, all right, the charge, I got a little bit more charge fluctuations here. How much energy was that to implement this classification at the 96% accuracy? Of course, there still was that step, like I was talking about, where you'd have to take that, you know, information off chip and, and do, um, uh, do that one final uh, softmax and stuff like that. Um, so there are th some things that aren't accounted for, but you can just kind of see that these energy scales, you know, 10 to the, 10 to the minus 21, um, yeah, if you can make this the dominant part of your compute, if you can make this the dominant part of your compute, it's gonna be a really promising technology, even without any quantum physics. You know, that th these type of analog operations, um, especially if you can combine it into a depth of compute, a depth of compute, it, 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 it has a, a you know, really promising future. Okay. So now on to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 how it's related to um, uh, this conference a little bit more and the, and the guys that kind of close up here. Um, <clears throat> so um, of course, one way that you can measure um, how bad things are um, from the classical dynamics is you can just kind of even just take a single AFP and you basically can anneal, unanneal, anneal, unanneal anneal, unanneal, and you can kind of measure how during this dynamics, you know, is there chaos or not? And I won't get into the details of this, but I can basically say that, you know, if you have a low Z bias, and so that means that you're bringing up the bump of your potential, you're kind of sitting up there on the top of the hill, you can imagine that that's gonna be the dangerous one where you, your phase particle gets brought up and now it's gonna start rolling down. That's gonna be where you, you begin to get chaos, where if you, were, if you were kind of tilted to begin with, you're bringing up the bump and you're just kind of sitting out over here, that's really not going to be very chaotic. Um, but you can, you, can, you can mitigate this um, by including resistance um, and so kind of dissipating things away, away like that. You have to double check to make sure that, you know, this is actually chaos, that, you're, that, you, that you, this kind of growing in the phase space isn't just due to uh, growing of your ener average energy. And uh, so yes, we do see that it is uh, chaos. But this is, this is, this is uh, a potential example um, um, where quantum effects might yield an advantage. So you put the hats on, you see your dynamics, and maybe the, you know, these kind of uh, chaotic effects, these uncontrollable effects um, are at least reduced. So this is gonna be one way that um, maybe you put the hats on and, uh, and the performance gets better. You engineer into a regime where the hats are relevant, I guess I would say. And, uh, and, and you get better performance than what you were expecting from the classical side. Here's another way. I was talking before about these kind of ways of describing things in terms of either your, um, you know, a, a operator basis or a uh, probability distribution rate basis. And you basically want to look at these transition rates, R uh, classical and R uh, quantum, and you want to kind of compare them, which is, is their fundamental difference. And um, if you look um, at, at basically these kind of high weight operators, these kind of uh, GHZ style operators, and you look at, okay, what if I start in, in an all zero state and I want to drive with, you know, like this P1 operator that's gonna drive me a direct high Hamming weight transition from zero to one, okay? Is there some sort of fundamental difference in this rate that's calculated between your classical and your quantum and you go and you do this, you do this calculation, and you see that you end up um, uh, evaluating something that's uh, directly equal to uh, Merman's inequality, and um, and you can basically say, oh wow, you know, like there you get an exponential difference between the quantum and classical in the rates that you can achieve, and I think that this is you know extremely. Um, you know, I certainly would have, <laughs> if I had appreciated the, the work of D-Wave before this conference, I would have <laughs> had this uh, slide be all about the differences um, of those scaling exponents because I think that that is way more compelling. But there are kind of fundamental reasons why, you know, there's just a difference between the rates that you can achieve, the transition rates that you can achieve between quantum and classical. So there is good reasons to put those hats on everything. 
And again, um, here's some review, re, uh, a review paper. I looked at this DQA. Um, and in that case, you really do need coherence between your computational uh, states. You, you're, it's not just a ground state calculation. You do need to have excited states, and you need to main co main, maintain coherence between things. And, um, and of course, uh, we heard a little bit about this RFQA, but this is another one um, where, where you kind of are you know, gener you know, going to these excited states a little bit, at least virtually. Um, and uh, so it, you know, this, these type of errors, are, um, having coherence is, is probably important. So as uh, Steve Disler uh, described, um, you know, one of the things that Northrop Grumman did recently is we generalized uh, the, the, the QEO test beds using some of the same design resources. Five minutes, two minutes, I'm done. I gotta stop now. In two minutes, if I want to questions, I do want questions. So I will stop in two minutes. Yeah. So we generalized those designs, just replacing uh, the kind of the single, uh, the single qu uh, quantum layer, and we made, a, uh, we made them a, a five by five grid of fluxonium, a lot of breakout circuits that have a higher probability of, of working as well. Um, this was kind of a, a bit of a speculative design, but it's, it's still compelling nonetheless. Um, and so uh, that's going to be really uh, exciting to look at because in terms of, um, you know, if you're trying to set an, uh, an annealing time here is a little bit, you know, faster than a microsecond, um, I guess uh, during this conference, I guess I've thought, you know, maybe, maybe even down in that 10 to 100 um, um, nanoseconds might be even the best type of target. But the, the phasing times of these kind of original QEO test bed were a bit better than that, um, but they're kind of, you would expect to get an error pretty typically. But when you, with Flexonium, you're in a completely different regime where, where uh, you could imagine that, you know, quite often you do a compute without getting any dephasing uh, uh, error. So um, one of the key things that we utilized um, was we used this full circuit Hamiltonian, again, because, you know, these collective modes of this, you know, a galvanically coupled circuit probably are important. Um, instead of going to that two-level approximation, we'd use the, that kind of the, 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 the full circuit Hamiltonian quantum. And um, what's nice, uh, about one of the nice things about uh, matrix product states is that the local basis can be pretty big, and it really doesn't hurt you in terms of, of, um, of the memory requirements um, like it does um, in a product basis where things grow exponentially. So um, in particular, we were able to find the ground state of this, uh, of this of this type of test bed as you know, the test bed got bigger and we saw about a, a, a quadratic scaling in both the time and memory scaling. And we were able to use these resources to kind of project out um, what type of coupling strengths we were gonna be able to achieve with these test beds um, using these uh, tensor network simulation resources. Um, so I, I encourage people to, uh, to look at those. Yeah. So this is just my summary slide. And uh, um, yeah, I think this is a really compelling approach. I will say that I have not really even talked about, you know, I've been talking about interactions between layers, just because that's what's implemented currently as the most promising classical approach. But I think interactions within a layer, um, as, you know, as D-Wave, this is an additional capability, you know, and so almost by a variational argument the, that uh, the computing power will only be enhanced by that. Um, but uh, I don't have a, a, a fully framed, uh, Reason why yet, but I'm sure it will be easily compared. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have time for a couple of questions, if there is. The furthermost point in. <laughs> Need some like uh, transition music, you know. Behaving. <laughs> So for AFP uh, description about the amount of uh, energy, like mm -hmm. uh, in a physical system, you would need the control circuit, right, uh, and refrigerator to put the system in. Uh, so how much does uh, that consume? So that would be the dominant uh, uh, error, depending on how big a compute you did. But I would, what I would say is. Um, some of the key capabilities, if, um, um, so adiabatic CMOS is a concept. Um, they, do, they, they do work at this um, in, in Sandia. 
Um, and there, one of the key things is uh, uh, resonant clock distribution. So, um, and they have a whole approach like uh, to develop these resonant clocks. So that's, that's gonna be a key aspect, right? Because um, you can't just have your, your clock just, <laughs> just, you know, being uh, dissipating all your power. That would not be good for reversible technology. And then you do need, um, all, you know, the ability to program, um, um, you know, pretty low power too. You know, you don't, don't want to lose everything there. Eventually, you do hope that your everybody says, "Oh, training is the dominant uh, form of, for machine learning." Well, hopefully not forever. <laughs> you know, hopefully you generate like a network that's actually useful. Um, but there are actually quite promising uh, ways um, to uh, uh, to do uh, programming near reversibly. And we've actually demoed some of those on the QEO uh, program as well. Um, I can be excited to talk to you about those ones. There is another question over here. John, uh, one of your first slides you showed on the non-stochastic uh, slide. Yeah. You showed uh, some new design there on the right, and I, yeah, so what, what is that? I, I yeah. wasn't able to catch the details. Yeah, yeah, so this one is, it's, it's pretty much a, a flexonium qubit. It's not tunable, so you can't anneal it, um, so you can't use it for annealing. Um, uh, but instead of having one black sheep, one weak, Junction. You put two right in a row. Okay. You can kind of see it down here in this image. Here are these superinductors, and then they use this Manhattan style uh, for their superinductances. And, and then this little tiny trace here is um, it has a little bit thinner aluminum and because you know uh, aluminum is weird. That disorder enhances the gap. This this uh, this island has a little bit higher of a gap, and so a quasi particle kind of gets generated. It comes in here. It goes through these superinductors, and the, and the superinductors really are diffusive for, for uh, quasi-particles, and it kind of slows it down, like rumble strips, and then it doesn't have enough energy to g get up here. At least that's be what the data is showing. They do show that without uh, implementing the gap, or with, sorry, without implementing uh, you know, the difference in gap for the small island, they see the standard, you know, both, both this is what we saw on QEO. You know, we saw, saw both curves at the same time. Um, so that you need the gap engineering. And then you can, so you get this nice uh, single, uh, you know, 2E periodicity, except for if you raise your temperature back up, now the quasi-particles do have enough energy to, to begin, you know, back quasi-particle poisoning. So to generalize this for annealing context, you have to go back to what, uh, you know, these, these, these JPSQ designs where these guys are now tunable. But the key thing is, is that instead of having, you know, just a, you know, one junction here or something like that, you know, not that you need superinductances to help with uh, uh, calming the quasi-particles. At least that's what this data is, is telling me. Okay. So uh, let's thank uh, Nidhi again.